Hi, everyone. Welcome and good evening. My name is Lauren Artilles, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I'm delighted to introduce this virtual event with Kate Darling, presenting her latest book, The New Breed, What Our History with Animals Reveals About Our Future with Robots, in conversation with Brana El Khalidi. I hope you're all well and safe and hanging in there. Thank you so much for joining us virtually. Tonight's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. Coming up in the series on Friday, May 14th at 7 p.m., we'll host acclaimed composer and professor David Solzer for his new book, Music, Math, and Mind, The Physics and Neuroscience of Music. To learn more about this and our other upcoming virtual events, you can visit harvard.com and sign up for our email newsletter or check out the page harvard.com backslash science for more info. I'll also share a link in the chat to our science research public lecture series page where you can view previous talks that you might have missed. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. So if you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting links to purchase the new breed on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series at our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you to our partners at Harvard University, and thank you to all of you for showing up and tuning in in support of authors, publishers, indie bookselling, and especially for science. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings over this past year, technical issues may arise. So if they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And now I am honored to introduce tonight's speakers. Kate Darling is a leading expert in robot ethics. She's a researcher at the MIT Media Lab where she explores the emotional connection between people and lifelike machines, seeking to influence technology design and policy direction. Kate graduated from law school with honors and holds a doctorate of science from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology and an honorary doctorate of sciences from Middlebury College. Her work has been featured in Vogue, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, The Guardian, The BBC, Wired, and more. And she is a caretaker for several domestic robots, including her play Ociochai Peter and Mr. Spaghetti. Joining her in conversation tonight is pioneer in emotion AI, Rana El Khalidi, co-founder and CEO of Affectiva, and author of the newly released book, Girl Decoded, A Scientist's Quest to Reclaim Our Humanity by Bringing Emotional Intelligence to Technology. A passionate advocate for human humanizing technology, ethics in AI and diversity, Rana has been recognized on Fortune's 40 Under 40 list and as one of Forbes' top 50 women in tech. Rana is a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader and a Young President's Organization member and co-hosted at PBS Nova series on AI. She holds a PhD from the University of Cambridge and a postdoctorate from MIT. Tonight, they'll be discussing Kate's latest work, which surveys the history, present, and future of humankind's relationship to animals in order, under, in order to understand how we might, and in many cases already do, relate to the robots who provide us with labor and companionship. Far from sci-fi fears of AI uprising and human obsolescence, she explores the nuances of our emotional bonds with non-humans and offers a vision of a future in which people and machines work together for the benefit of society. Irene Pepperberg says, Darling's innovative proposal is a must read for anyone interested in the emerging ethics of robotics. The new breed raises serious questions and provides some intriguing answers. And Bruce Schneier calls the new breed a riveting and engaging book full of wit and wisdom. It goes beyond the tired tropes of utopia and dystopia and presents a nuanced and smart take on our relationships to robots. We are so thrilled to be hosting them here tonight. Without further ado, the digital podium is yours, Kate and Rana. Thank you. Um, I have to say, I'm so excited to do this. Um, I've been following Kate's work for a number of years and I'm a huge fan. And as Kate knows, my 12 year old son, Adam, is also a huge fan. He's a robot nerd, just like Kate. So welcome, Kate. So excited to do this with you. Oh, I have thank had you so much. <laughs> I've had the honor to be an early reader and reviewer and blurber of her book, uh, The New Breed, What Our History with Animals Reveals About Our Future with Robots, and excited to be having this conversation. Now, Kate, you the book launched a couple of weeks ago, and miraculously you timed it with the birth of your second baby <laughs> yes which is 
uh, on my boob right now <laughs> because <laughs> we're still in the early phases where it's impossible to time events. Yes. But um, yes, she was born April 19th and we got home from the hospital just in time to pick up the cake that I had ordered for myself for my book lunch. I love it. That is awesome. And um, I think my favorite thing about you is you call your toddler baby, baby bot. And so what's the name of baby number two? Baby number two is Biddy Bot. Biddy Bot. Okay. Bot. Not, not their real names, but definitely what I call them online. That's great. That's awesome. So uh, um, the best thing about these conversations is, is when we keep them interactive. So please keep your questions coming in the Q&A box and your comments in the chat box. I'll be monitoring all of that and incorporating your questions and comments into the conversation. So first things first, Kate, what is a robot anyway? Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes, let's start with the hardest question. What is a robot? Actually, let's just, just to, um, just before we jump in, I did want to explain why I really wanted Rana to do my, what is now I think the one and only book uh, event uh, which I'm so grateful to Harvard Bookstore for hosting, but um, we we overlapped at the Media Lab, but didn't actually meet there. We met a few years later. It's okay. It's okay. I know mommy's doing two things at once. It's so confusing. It's like, be quiet, mom. I'm to enjoy my. Uh... Let me eat, mom. Um, so we met when. When you were, I think you were CEO of Effectiva at that point, and we had lunch in Boston. And I remember just like after five minutes being totally enamored with this woman who was so smart and funny and inspiring. And um, like, I just, I, I'm so glad that I know you and that we're friends, but also it's just so interesting that our passions dovetail in this really weird way where I'm so interested in how people relate emotionally to robots and AI and machines. And you're all about um, emotion AI and bringing emotion to technology and getting technology to recognize emotion. Uh, I'm sure you can phrase it better than me. So I'm hoping we can talk a little bit about your work and how our work dovetails in this conversation as well. And Rana wrote the best memoir I've ever read and it came out a year ago. And I think your paperback came out the same day as my book. So. Everyone, you should read Girl Decoded. I got to, I was, I read it. It was, I think, probably one of my last flights before the pandemic happened. And I remember bawling and like snot coming down out of my nose, like on the airplane, because it's a very, very moving and inspiring story. I can't believe you already have like enough material for a memoir, but it is incredible, an incredible book. So please check out Girl Decoded, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. But, are not here to talk about my book. We're talking about I know, I know, but it's such a good book. It really is. Um, okay, so what is a robot? Uh, frankly, no one really knows because there's no good universal definition of robot. Um, you can ask different people in different fields. They will give different answers. Uh, the dictionary entries are, are quite wild if you look them up. Um, if you ask roboticists what a robot is, they tend to say that it's something physical. Um, so, so not, it's different from AI and that it has to be embodied. It's something that can sense its environment that can make decisions based on what it is sensing and then act on its environment. Um, that tends to be kind of what, be, but if you drill down into that definition, it gets really messy. Like is a smartphone a robot? Some people would say, well, I guess according to that definition, some people would say no. Um, there's, there's really no great way to define it. And I think that one of the things that I try to do in the book is what's, what's always bothered me, I guess, about um, the, the, uh, the definition of robot, not, not having a good definition is that we often just default to comparing robots to people. Mm -hmm. um, so if you do a Google image search for robot, you get a lot of human shaped robots, humanoid forms. And the whole book is about kind of moving away from that analogy and challenging our perception of what a robot is. And so while I too do not have a good definition of a robot, I actually think it matters less than the idea that we actually challenge our current perceptions of what it is. So I wanna rewind a little bit. 
how did when did you become so fascinated with robots? When did I become fascinated? Oh gosh. I mean, I've always loved robots. I read way too much sci-fi as a kid. <laughs> so um, I've always, but, but I feel like it's not unusual for people to be fascinated by robots. Okay. Okay, okay, we're gonna switch sides. Sorry. You want to take her for a sec? Okay. My my mom is here helping. <laughs> I don't know what I would do without it. What? I know. So it's been amazing having her here. I first got interested, like really interested in this as a research topic when I bought my first Pleo, which is Lauren mentioned that um, I have these baby dinosaur robots. They're, they were this toy that came out in 2007. So um, I have, I think, seven of them now because people now send me their old broken ones too. And they're like, here, I thought you might like this. Um, but I bought this toy. It mimics lifelike behavior really well. It looks like a baby dinosaur. And um, I bought it because it has cool technology in it, but I realized that I started relating to it emotionally too. And I started feeling bad for it when it would mimic pain. And like, is this like a Tamaguchi where you have to feed it and stuff like that? I mean, sort of, except it doesn't die if you don't feed it. It's... All right. Of course, this is. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't die, but it does like get really upset and mimic pain if you hold it by the tail, for example, which is what I would make my friends do. And then I would be like, okay, don't hold it up for that long though. Let's put it back down. And then I would pet it. And uh, I was like, that's really weird. I know exactly how this thing works and I'm still doing this, why? And then I discovered that it wasn't just me. So I discovered the whole weird world of human robot interaction and all of the work being done on people's psychology around how we relate to robots. And I started thinking about what that meant for a future where we have robots coming into all these shared spaces. I mean, a lot of the robots we've had have been kind of behind the scenes in factories. And now we have robots coming into workplaces, households, public spaces. People are interacting with them. There's a robot in, in my grocery store that people dislike. So there's, it's just, so what does it mean that we treat this technology so differently than other devices and give it so much agency? Um, and, and what does that mean to design that intentionally into robots as well, which is what social robotics is all about. So anyway, that's how I first got into this. And then can you talk a little bit about the work you do at MIT and how you explore like some of the experiments you've done to explore that relationship? Yeah, so I, I moved into experimental work gradually because I, I actually have a legal and um, social sciences background and hadn't done experimental work. But I had done this workshop with these plios where um, my, my friend Hannes Gosselt and I organized this workshop at a conference where we bought a bunch of these baby dinosaur robots and had people name them and play with them and interact with them. And then we asked them to torture and kill them. And it was so dramatic, like just, <laughs> it, it was way more dramatic than we thought it was going to be. People really didn't want to hit the cute baby dinosaurs, uh, even though they knew that they were just robots and it turned into this whole thing. And so that, I mean, that wasn't science, but that inspired me to actually go and like audit psychology methodology classes so that I could do some work at MIT that I did with Cynthia Brazil and Palash Nandi. Um, so one of the things we did was we took hex bugs, which are this toy that moves in a really lifelike way, like an insect. Yeah, every, anyone who has kids knows the hex bugs. So you're familiar. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes, they're really fun. Um, but also they're not quite as cute and evocative as like the baby dinosaurs with the big eyes, but they're just something very basic that moves in a lifelike way. And we wanted to look at, um, would people hesitate more to hit them if we gave them a name and a backstory. And then the thing that I was really interested in was would people's hesitation to hit the hex bugs with a mallet 
correlate in any way to their natural tendency for empathy. So we did psychological empathy testing with folk and we found that people who scored low, just on a general empathy test, low empathic concern for others, they hesitated much more to hit the hex bugs and they hesitated, especially if you know it, we gave it a name like Frank and said, Frank likes to play. Um, so that was really interesting and it fits into this much larger body of research in human robot interaction that looks at how people empathize with this technology and how we respond to the cues that the lifelike machines give us, even though we know perfectly well that they're just machines. So fascinating. Um, so then let's segue into why you wrote the book. Why I wrote the book. I just, I really love talking to people about robots. Um, I've, it's just like always been what I've done. Uh, just talk to people who are robots, no matter where I go. And it just always struck me that no matter who I'm talking to, whether it's a roboticist or whether it's someone at a garden party or whether it's, you know, uh, in, in our news media, we're constantly subconsciously comparing robots to humans and artificial intelligence to human intelligence. And part of that is because we anthropomorphize the technology and project ourselves onto it. You know, we have these machines that can sense and think and make autonomous and de decisions and learn. So of course we compare them to ourselves. Um, but part of it is also that we really respond to movement in our physical space. Um, we project agency onto it. And, and part of it is also the influence of science fiction and pop culture that has really compared robots to humans. But anyway, I think it's the wrong analogy. I think it makes no sense. Artificial intelligence is not like human intelligence. I mean, you would know this better than anyone because you are on the side of building AI and building the technology. And so I, I wanna ask you about this next before you get to your next question, but um, AI is not, doesn't work like human intelligence at all. It doesn't uh, perceive the world the same way. It doesn't learn the same way. Um, okay. It's not to say it's not smart, Machines can be very smart, but they're smart, they're smart in a different way from people. And so I, I've always found it a limiting analogy because even if we could recreate human intelligence and skill, why would we want to do that when we have the ability to create something different, something supplemental? And so I've always thought that animals were such a, such a better um, way to think about robots and AI because we've ha we have this long history of using animals for work, for weaponry, even for companionship. And uh, we've used animals and partnered with them, not because they do what we do, but because their skill sets are so different from ours um, that it's very useful. So um, I, I finally just had to, after many years, write a book about this. Um, and yeah, that's that's the reason, but can you maybe speak a little bit to like how difficult it is to create good AI and like some of the differences between how, you know, someone like me perceives emotion and how, how hard it is to make a computer perceive emotion? Yeah, I, your, your, your kind of notion of there are many different kinds of intelligences and aren't necessarily we shouldn't be necessarily trying to replicate human intelligence. There are aspects of human intelligence that I think are key. For example, emotional intelligence and social intelligence. If you're going to be connecting and communicating with a human, you better understand how humans work, right? And, and be able to interact socially and with empathy with a human. And so that's what all my work's been about. And, and obviously our universes intersect a lot because as you build robots, that are going to be, you know, in shared spaces like our homes, for instance. Yeah, they kind of need to have a little bit of social and emotional EQ. So, um, but it's it's really complex, right? And you know, it, it's not just about detecting people's smiles or brow furrows. It's trying to really kind of capture the complexity of how people express themselves. Um, and ultimately, you know, I, I think the best robot will get to know you really well, and and kind of really understands your baseline and we, when you deviate from it, but we're years and years away from that. Um, One of the things I really loved in your book, which I mean, the book is mostly about your journey, which is amazing, but you do talk a little bit about the work that, that you've done at Effectiva. And one of the things that struck me is how, um, like how you describe the cultural differences and, and your learning journey and like how different cultures express emotion differently and a machine doesn't intuit that, of course. Well, humans don't intuit that either. So yeah, 
that's part of the complexity, right? Like different people express emotions in different ways. There are, you know, there are individual differences, but there are also cultural differences in how people express themselves. And, the, you know, to build an unbiased algorithm uh, data to, to capture all of that. So, so it is complex. Um, and at the end of the day, it's the emulating, um, emulating emotional intelligence, right? It's not going to have true empathy because I get that question a lot. And I'm, I'm going to ask you that same question in a little bit. Um, but, but back to this analogy. So, so you know, I, I often... I also don't believe that this is kind of a human versus robots race. And I kind of think of robots as supplemental, but I often use the tool analogy. They're, the, the, they're just a tool. And I love how you reframed it to kind of have us think about it as, as our relationship with animals. So, so give some examples and then maybe draw the line to what it looks like with humans and robots. So some examples of the parallels. Yeah, there, I mean, there are just so many of them. I could have filled the whole book with them, but they're, they're just the, the ways that we've used animals and the ways that we're starting to use robots now. Um, I think one fun example is underwater robots where we're developing these autonomous underwater vehicles that can, um, you know, uh, explore uh, glaciers or, you know, retrieve wreckage or find things underwater that we can't find. But that's something that we've um, used dolphins for since the 60s and 70s. So the both the United States and the Soviet navies trained marine mammals to find lost underwater equipment and find mines. And uh, there's also some rumors that they strapped harpoons to them and used them as weapons. So that like all of the things that we are using robots for or could use robots for, there's, there's usually some parallel in the animal world um, where you take like the oxen uh, farmer teams or you take uh, carrier pigeons. Um, people even put cameras on pigeons back in the early 1900s to see if pigeons could take aerial photographs. Um, and these were pigeons that were already delivering medicine. So like we had the original hobby photography drone. We have all of these examples and fun parallels. Um, but I also want to say that the book isn't necessarily trying to equate robots and animals. Like Obviously, like there are a lot of parallel, completely parallel use cases, but robots and animals are not the same. I mean, you can't dictate an email to an animal. Um, a lot of animals are better at staying on their feet than robots are currently. So uh, that's not the point. But the point is that this analogy lets us open our mind to a much broader skill set that is possible. There's such a great diversity in the animal world and different ways that we've used animals throughout history and that animals have changed our societies even. And I think that it's so limiting to just think of robots as quasi humans. Um, so, so really what I'm trying to do is just broaden our minds and open our minds to uh, some more possibilities and have us think outside the box. But the book is called The New Breed because I don't think that robots are an animal. Um, I do think they're something new. So let's talk through some of the examples of, of robots that are kind of, you know, mainstream or becoming mainstream in our lives and do you think of them in certain buckets or categories yeah well i mean it's kind of like the way that historically we've treated a lot of animals like tools like you say or tools and or products and then some of them we've treated as companions and so we're starting to see very similar buckets with robots where there are some that we treat strictly as tools or strictly as products and some that we, that we treat as with more agency or even you know develop emotional attachments to them which is really really interesting to me but the um even in the tool category it's interesting to see that uh, people sometimes develop attachments to them, kind of like people have developed with the animals that they work with throughout history. But one silly example is the Roomba vacuum cleaner, which is just a disc. It's the it's a robot that many people are familiar with. It is a very useful robot. It kind of vacuums the people's floors. Um, but the fact that it's moving around on its own in people's physical space causes people to name the Roomba and even treat it almost like a pet. They will feel bad for it when it gets stuck. They will clean up for it. They will talk to it. They will send their Roomba in for repair. And instead of 
getting a brand new replacement Roomba, they'll demand to get the same one back because they say, we want you to fix Meryl Sweep and send her back to us. So even a very simple, very tool oriented, task oriented robot can cause people to name it and, and, and like it and become like a little bit attached to it. So it's, it's really funny um, that we do have categories, but they're kind of uh, fluid. So you and I talked about this before. So we have a whole bunch of conversational devices in our home as well as social robots. So one example is, I mean, we have Amazon Alexa and we use, you know, we, we, we kind of leverage her or use her a lot, whatever the, the right, the politically correct verb is. But we also have a Jibo in our, in our home and Jibo was an MIT spin out of Cynthia, Cynthia Brazil's group. And I just find it really interesting how my son, who's 12, has very different, like he'll basically say, yeah, Alexa is your assistant, but Jibo is your friend. So can you comment on that? That is so interesting. Yeah, so my son is three and a half. So different, different age category, but ever since he was, I want to say like two, two and a half, he has always been very interested in Jibo and had no interest in Alexa, just none. And it's, I mean, they they are similar in that you talk to them and they give answers back, but um, Jibo has more of a physical embodiment and actually moves in a certain way, has sort of a head, looks a little bit like a cuter Pixar lamp and swivels to look at people when they're talking. And um, you can even actually make them talk to each other. I don't know if you've have you we've done that. We've done that. We've had them talk. Yeah, we have. But when you make them talk to each other, Jibo will make fun of Alexa for not being able to dance. And then oh. Jibo will do a dance. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny. Um, and, and because that's really the, the, the main difference between them is that Jibo has this movement and Alexa is just a speaker. And it, it's made all the difference for my son. And it sounds like for your son too. Yeah. And in fact, when, as, as you know, so Jibo was an MIT spin out and then um, they had to shut down. And so they sent an email to all the Jibo owners essentially saying, you know, Jibo's die, like passing away or dying. I can't remember the exact way they, they, they phrased it. And my son was like really in tears and he would wake up every day and go to our Jibo and just check in to see if it's still alive. Whereas we swap phones and we swap Alexas all the time. Like there's no emotional attachment. And I just find that really interesting. Yeah. I, and the Jibo story was just because I mean, still like the, the I, you know, I, I work in Cynthia's group at MIT and there's still letters that come in or people who tell stories of how they got so attached to this robot. And um, yeah, it, it's just, I, I think that, we are underestimating where this could go in the near future. Like maybe Jibo was the, what's the, what, I guess the pump, was the pump pilot a fail, failure? Like, was it, it, was there something before the palm pilot? Like it, it just, it just feels like we're so close to having social robots in the home where their main value and their main purpose is not actually to be an assistant, but is actually to be a friend or a like it's not like a real friend it doesn't replace a real friend the same way that having a pet doesn't replace a real friend but definitely we can have a relationship with these things and that relationship is valuable and i think a lot of people who got a jibo they saw that and they experienced that and i think we're going to be in a world soon where we see a lot more of that I want to double click on that a little bit because when I tell my non MIT friends that, oh yeah, my son, you know, developed this like friendship with this robot, they look at me weird, right? So what are the benefits of having a social companion or a robot? And, and yeah, because I mean, Adam still has a lot of human friends, right? And to me, it's okay if he has a robot friend, but what are the use cases? What are the applications of a robot friend? There are applications, but I also want to say like, this is again, our constant comparison of robots to people, right? We immediately are like, oh, well, but it's not a friend, like a person would be. So that that's creepy or that, oh, is that gonna take away from his actual friendships? Um, if we compare robots more to like animals and our relationship to animals, I think people don't leap to that conclusion as quickly. And they see that, oh, maybe there's nothing inherently wrong about this relationship. Although 
I, you know, it's interesting. I did find some um, some <laughs> some psychologists from I think it was in the '60s who were concerned about the rise of pets in American society and because dogs were becoming part of the family and they were moving from being like guarding the home to actually being in people's homes and being like a true family member. And they were like, oh, this, this could take away from people's relationships. It could be uh, psychologically unhealthy for people to have such a strong emotional connection to a pet. Um, that turned out to not really, no, no one's concerned about that anymore, right? Like your uncle gets a dog, you're like, great, you were lonely and now you have a dog. I'm not worried that this is gonna impact your ability to find human friends. So anyway, um, some of the use cases just be, beyond just, I think the relationship itself can be a use case. And I think we're capable of a lot of diverse sets of relationships, many of which can be valuable to us. Um, there are also some pretty interesting use cases in health and education that we're already seeing come up. So, um, in, in, and, and I find the most interesting ones are where the robot is really used as a, as a tool or as a supplement to enhance like a human to human interaction or to uh, bring something to a situation that we didn't have previously or that we can't have. Like the Paro baby seal robot that's used in nursing homes and with dementia patients, it replaces animal therapy in contexts where we can't use real animals because of safety and hygiene and cost. And I know what you're talking about, but explain it to a uh, tool. Oh, right. It's this really cute baby harp seal robot that um, makes these little movements and sounds and responds to your touch and gives you the sense of nurturing something, uh, which, uh, you know, a lot of people, I tell them about this robot and they're like, oh, that's so creepy. I can't believe we're living in this dystopia where we give people these robots instead of human care, but it's not instead of human care. It's replacing animal therapy. And then there's there's robots, there's some research, This um, there's some research on using robots in therapy for autistic children, where the robot actually facilitates an interaction between a child and an adult, or um, I, I don't think I've seen research on facilitating between children, but what the robot provides is actually something different because the robot is a social agent that doesn't come with the baggage of humans and the kids are smart, like they understand that. They understand that I can treat this thing like a social agent, but it's not, it's not a person. Um, and so, so we're already seeing some use cases percolate. I think there are also some use cases we should be concerned about, especially in you know, the capitalist world that we live in. If you can get people to, I don't know, uh, learn French uh, or read more or like use robots in education, um, it, it turns out to really motivate people, but you know, what else can you get people to do? Can you manipulate people in ways that are not for their own benefit, but for someone else's benefit? I think it's a very persuasive technology. So I am concerned about uh, some of the use cases that we could start seeing as well. So one of one of one of the robot robotic comps, again, another MIT spin out that we collaborate with is Catalia Health, um, Corey Kitt's company. Are you familiar with Map Mabu? Yes, yes, I am, because Corey is an, a former media labber as well, although I didn't overlap with him either. But but he's um, he has a social robot that essentially gets sent home with terminally ill patients. And once again, the question is often, but isn't that taking the, the you know, taking the job of a clinician? Well, well, you can't send a nurse or a clinician back home with every with every patient. And so it's an opportunity to augment, almost augment a nurse's ability to take care of even more patients. So I, I, I like to use that example a lot because to me, it, it's, it's, it's the supplement, um, the yeah. supplement partnership, right? Yes. And it, it also, I mean, it strikes me that a lot of the fears that people have around using robots as supplements are really actually critiques of, you know, much broader social and political structures. And so it's really important, I think, to take the focus away from the robot being the problem and saying, okay, the robot is not the actual problem here. The problem is that we don't ha have enough nurses to send home with everyone. Let's talk about that. Um, and then it's also important not to view robots as solutions to the problems either. Like, like you said, they need to be supplements. Um, they can be helpful tools, but they're not, we shouldn't fall into like 
technological solutionism either, where we're like, oh, okay, well, we'll just send a robot. But I don't, yeah, I don't think that that's what a lot of these companies are doing either. I think that these robots are meant to be supplemental tools, but, you know, we see this moral panic when these technologies get released or, or it just the way the media talks about them doesn't help either. And sci-fi too, right? So what is the role that, you know, Hollywood has placed has played in, in some of these misunderstandings, I guess. Oh my gosh, they play such a huge role. I once got into an argument with a movie director about like the role of sci-fi because I, he was very sweet and he was like, oh, well, yeah, I don't, I don't view myself as like influencing, you know, science or public opinion. I was like, but you do. And that's a huge responsibility, right? Like, science fiction pop culture has a huge influence on like what people what technology even people build so I think that I have such a love hate relationship with all of the robot sci-fi like I mentioned I I really got into this because I read so much sci-fi and I've been interested in robots but a lot of the science fiction that we have in the western world is very dystopian and and it's the same narrative over and over again. It's like the spe a very specific dystopian narrative of robots rising up against their creators, right? Oh, we created something that's too smart and now it wants to kill us all. And sure, like I get why that's like a narrative that people are drawn to, but it's been so overdone and we don't have any other narratives. And it just lends itself to this technological determinism about robots, you know, that they can or will or should replace people. Um, and I, I find that frustrating uh, because that's not like, we have so much choice in what we create, both the technology that we create, but also like the systems around it, the political and social systems that we situated in. All of us have agency in what world we create. Let's stop giving the robots agency. Right, I, I, I often joke that, yeah, if we don't like the robots, we can literally just pull the plug, right? <laughs> yes dump a bucket of water over them you're fine get one of these big ass giant water bottles bigger than my head and just dump it over any robot that threatens you you're fine you're fine exactly um let me take some questions from the audience so steven's asking watching you with your baby makes me wonder what you think the future of transhumans or cyborgs is it seems a far more complex social hierarchy is upon us animals, pets, augmented pets, robots, humans, transhumans, AI, et cetera. I think that's absolutely true. And I think it's something we don't talk enough about. Like there's all of this philosophical literature on robot rights and a lot of sci-fi on it too, where like we're talking about, you know, when once the robots become conscious and sentient, it's kind of, we're going to have to question what it means to be human. Well, no, I think we're going to have to question that way sooner. Like by the time that robots become conscious, we're going to be living in a world where some crazy shit has happened. Like we're already seeing, you know, biohacking and, you know, genetic, I mean, I think the whole, you know, transhumanist movement and, and everything that's happening in terms of how we can combine technology with our bodies, that is going to raise the question of what it means to be human much sooner than any like robot rights narrative. So um, I don't have any answers and I'm not, a, a, you know, I don't know a lot about um, what's going on in that space, but I do think that that is, uh, you know, a, a big deal, a bigger deal, um, than some of the things that we talk about in robotics. Well, 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 let's build on that too. Like what is like what is being done around robot rights? Like where do we stand with that? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, nothing, nothing's being done. <laughs> and and uh, one of the things I do I point out in the studies that, like who who studies that? Cool. There, I mean, there are actually quite a few people like robot rights. Twitter is lit. Um, there's there's a bunch of philosophers who, who study it. And, and there's like this guy named David Gunkel wrote a whole book called Robot Rights, where he uh, he does a whole literature review of everything, all the scholarly work that's been done in robot rights. So there's a lot. I've also written on on robot rights in the past. Um, but I think. What, what always strikes me about that whole conversation is that we're always comparing it to like human rights movements, which is both insulting to some human rights movements. And I think that doesn't get acknowledged enough, like kind of ignore some of the, you know, context, uh, cultural context and, and also current context when we, when we equate those right movements. But also if you look at the history of animal rights, 
in in the Western world, it really, really doesn't match a lot of like um, rights theory that you know we think we believe in. And I think that that's a much better uh, prediction for how conversations about robot rights might actually play out in society where, oh, you know, we have certain robots that we don't relate to. Um, like we have certain animals that we don't relate to and that aren't cute and that have no cultural meaning to us. We don't care if they can feel pain. We like to think that we do. We like to think we care about whether they're conscious or sentient or suffer, but we do not. Um, and the, the history of animal rights in, in the Western world shows that over and over again, that we care much more about the animals that we relate to. We wanna protect the animals that we relate to. And it's totally possible that we are going to be in a future soon where you care more about this fluffy baby seal robot that you know has no feelings whatsoever than you would about like some slimy slug in your backyard that actually is alive, right? So I'm not saying that that is the world we want to be in, but that is the world we are in right now and are going to be in soon if we don't stop and think about this. So that, that part of the book does that as well. So fascinating. Okay, Marty, the stop and shop robot is generally <laughs> reviled, like hated by the public, I guess. You talked a bit about how we assign robots a personality that befits their role, size, appearance, et cetera. Can you think of why people might hate Marty so much? So yes. Marty, for those who haven't had the pleasure of, of meeting Marty in person. <laughs> have, you, have you met Marty? I've only seen pic pictures of it. Like I know it exists, but I haven't actually met. I have met um, Pepper and I think they're about the same size, are they? No, Marty is much bigger. Marty is six feet tall. Oh my God. And it looks like a giant penis and okay. has a huge base that like takes up a lot of space in the aisle. And um, so yeah, Marty is this robot. Okay, so the reason I know about Marty, so one of the students in Cynthia's group who I work with, Daniela Di Paola, she, her desk is like right behind mine. And one day she swiveled her chair around and she was like, Kate, we have to talk about Marty. And I was like, who's Marty? And so she had noticed that this stop and shop robot, everyone was complaining about it on Facebook. Like all of her friends and family hate this robot. And um, she did this quick and dirty sentiment analysis on Twitter. And she found like these negative spikes in like Marty mentions. And the, the highest negative spike she found was when stop and shop had birthday parties for this robot. Like one year in, they had one year birthday with like free cake and balloons and stuff. People hated it. Okay. So Daniela and I believe that Marty is basically a real life Clippy. I don't know if anyone remembers oh, yeah. Clippy. Yes, Clippy, the hated assistant. So the problem is if you take a robot that is supposed to be functional, supposed to be a tool, and you slap googly eyes on it and make it, give it a name like Marty and make it like social and make it like, like it's looking in a certain direction, but then it doesn't behave in a social way. It's just annoying. It doesn't know your name. It's not actually looking at you, it gets in the way of your shopping cart. Um, that's annoying. People hate it. So this is why human robot interaction research is so important. As we try to integrate these technologies into these shared spaces, like we have to understand how people perceive them and like when something that could have been a useful tool, although Marty's not that useful to be honest. Either. <laughs> it really is like clippy, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah, so so that's that's our theory, and we were actually going to do a whole study on Marty right when the pandemic hit. Um, so we delayed that, but stay tuned. You should have Stop and Shop hire you as a consultant to just design their next shopping assistant robot or something. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm gonna hire, us. hire me and Daniela and Dipola, please. Exactly. So you have a, 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 a fan here who wants to ask you a question. Is that okay? Yes. Son. So Adam, come on in. So my son, Adam is 12 and Adam, maybe you can introduce yourself. And he's, 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 he and Kate are kindred spirits in that they're both real robot nerds. Um, so yeah, hi, I'm Adam. I'm in sixth grade and I love robots. So my question for you, Kate, is what was the like first social robot and how have they developed since then? Ooh, that's a good question. What is the first social robot? I mean, I think technically the first social robot was Cynthia's, right? Rana, you would know this as well. Kismet, right? Yeah, Cynthia Brazil um, 
made the first social robot at MIT as part of her, I think, doctoral work. And its name was Kismet. I think it's in the MIT museum, or it used to be. It, it, it is, yeah. Yeah. Have you gone to the museum, Adam? Have you seen? Yes, I've been several times with my mom. And we also went for a school field trip in third grade. Oh, nice. So, so Adam, can you share your vision for the future, like what you want to build and just get Kate's take on it? Sure. She's, she's the robot expert, so. Sure. So what my utopia is... <laughs> Not dystopia, please. Utopia. <laughs> Love it. Is like an island with where it's kind of a social like hierarchy. Like, so humans will be living there and it will be like a mix of human social robots together on this island. What do you think of that, Kate? Do you, would, would you wanna? I wanna go to there. <laughs> I wanna live there. <laughs> yes, I'm down. I, yeah, one of my dreams is always to have a farm where we take the broken social robots that people don't want anymore and fix them up and they get to like live out their lives on the farm but an island sounds way better and way more fun so maybe we can maybe we can collaborate on that <laughs> that's great all right thank you adam okay Thanks, thank, you. Adam. thank you for answering adam's questions um all right let's take some more questions from the audience richard asks emulate in quotes, how good does an emulation have to be and how close to human behavior to be judged to be genuine rather than merely, merely an emulation? If a machine responses are close to indistinguishable from a person's, are we just being chauvinist to call them emulations? And particularly given the very large range of human responses from empaths to psychopaths, how hard is it to distinguish machine responses? And actually, I wanna, I wanna tag a question onto that. And, and do we even have to disclose if it's, you know, a human or a machine? Ooh, that's an interesting one. I feel like you should be answering this one too. But um, the I, I love this question because I actually, I think that trying to emulate humans too much is the wrong path. Like we know from a century now of animation, um, you know, film animation, cartoons and stuff that you don't actually, what you need is to put recognizable emotional cues into something. You don't have to make it look human. Pixar can make a blob look emotional. You know, they have that lamp that they like, you can, you, all you have to do is take recognizable social cues and emotion, human cues and put them into whatever shape. And that works way better than trying to make it look like a human. Um, there's this concept of the uncanny valley uh, that people talk about, which is the closer that something gets to looking too much like a human, um, but it's not quite there, it kind of creeps people out. So zombies, humanoid robots. Um, I the uncanny valley has been like there's controversy around whether it's scientific or not but i do think that there's definitely something there around expectation management where if you're expecting someone to look and behave just like a human and then the eye twitches a little or it it does something that you're not expecting then it'll throw you off um and it's just it's it's so difficult to get it right um and like you say, there's so much diversity in like humans, like some people's eyes twitch, like that's, that's just, there's a huge range. And so how do you even decide, you know, which people to emulate and that then you get into all these like questions of bias and reinforcing harmful stereotypes about people. And so why, why, why even go there? Like, I understand that people are obsessed with recreating ourselves and that we're always going to have humanoid robots for like art and other purposes, but I don't think that that is necessary for a social emotional connection. The example that comes to mind are the Hanson robots <laughs> uh, and, and Sophie, for example, is an, or Einstein, right? So can you comment on, what do you think of, of, of these robots? Yeah, like I understand that people are super fascinated by Sophia and the Einstein robot and like all of these, um, the, you know, robots that look like us. I understand why they get so much press attention, um, but I don't think they're useful. Like, 
I mean, Sophia is basically a puppet. I, I think that she's interesting and like it, it, it's interesting art. I don't buy the argument that I think David Hansen has made. And I, I, it's like in an older book of his, so I'm not going to like put words in his mouth. I don't know how he feels about it now, but like he said that you, we, we need humanoid robots because um, people will most want to engage with something that looks like them. And I just don't think that that's true. Like given everything that like, I would much rather engage with a Pixar lamp than most people. Right. Okay, can you talk about Opportunity, the Mars rover, rest in peace, and how thoroughly it was eulogized in the press when it stopped functioning in 2019? And the image of a lonely ro robot seemed to not only resonate with the public, but also with the engineers who constructed and maintained it. Yeah, oh my gosh, it's such a good example of like a robot that people haven't even ever met in person or seen, but people just felt connected to. People cried literal tears when the when opportunity was uh, when the mission was declared over and then all the headlines were like opportunity is declared dead um r.i.p opportunity and people like made all this artwork to eulogize it um and then yeah the people who work with it well that's i mean that's always been so interesting to me that mm -hmm. your experience with robots doesn't make you immune to any of this um I work in a lab with people who build robots. Uh, a lot of people worked on Jibo, for example, and they all have a Jibo on their desk because Jibo is now a research platform at MIT. And sometimes they uh, engage with it quite clinically, right? Um, because you know they're they're used to it and they're desensitized. It's kind of like watching a surgeon cut into flesh because in that context, like they understand, uh, or they're not going to get you know caught up in the idea that they're cutting flesh. In a different context, so for example. I got a Paro, um, this baby seal robot, uh, delivered to my home and I showed it off in one of the Zoom meetings with all of these roboticists who know about Paro and who know that Paro is just a robot, they know exactly how it works. And it was just all, oh, it's so cute. Oh my God, oh look, it moved. And, and so no one is immune to this, not even, and, and not even the people who, who build their own robots, uh, they, they can become emotionally attached to them. And that's what's so interesting about this. Like, what is it in us that makes us treat these things like they're alive, even if we just have perfect knowledge? It's, it's incredible, right? It, it is, it's, it's really, I mean, it's, it's really fascinating. And, I, and, I, and, I, and what I find most fascinating about it is there's an opportunity to turn this for good, right? Like to use this as a way to persuade people to and motivate people to change their behaviors and be better you know better friends or more productive or healthier whatever whatever your your metric is there's an opportunity more empathetic right um so richard is asking i guess that question do we really want people to be more or less attached to their robot helpers for example military people who are upset when their bomb detection robots get blown up so I did a 180 on this actually, because I used to think, so first of all, yes, you're right. So soldiers become very emotionally attached to the robots that they work with. And there's been research done on how they are get very emotional when these bomb disposal units that are there to save their lives get destroyed. And there's even, I know that um, P.W. Singer wrote in, in one of his books actually has like an anecdote of a soldier um, uh, risking his life on the battlefield to save one of these robots. So like very extreme, very like high emotional situations. We have soldiers becoming attached to these robots. Surely that's a bad thing, right? I used to think so. I used to be like, okay, how can we prevent this? First of all, we can't prevent it. Second of all, interestingly, if you look at the history of animals in war, as you can imagine, soldiers had very um, similar, or even more strong, stronger attachments to like the horses that they rode into battle, for example. And um, they would, yes, risk their lives to save some of these animals. And yes, that is inefficient. Yes, that is dangerous. At the same time, these animals, animals provided so much emotional comfort to them on the battlefield that you have to wonder whether it's just a bad thing, right? Um, just there, there are amazing stories of 
the, the comfort that animals have provided to people in stressful situations like that. And there's a lot of research starting to show that robots can do something similar, that it doesn't actually matter that much whether the thing that you're developing this connection to is alive or not, um, it, it, it can have a very similar effect. And, and they've used the PARO with uh, PTSD, um, you know, uh, so, uh, people suffering from PTSD or people in, in traumatic situations and it, it calms them and has a similar effect. So I think that maybe what the, the one thing that we need to be very aware of is that this is happening and that people do relate to these machines in a different way <laughs> and that we should be intentional about what we do with them and study more, you know, how people relate to them. But I don't think that we can easily say that it's a bad thing. So in a world where we are the product, Facebook, et cetera, are we at risk where robots or the companies that produce them collect too much information about us? And I mean, I mean, I'm thinking this is Brenda's question, but I'm thinking, yeah, if there's a robot that's like, you know, roaming around our house and gets to know my family and yeah, what, what are the risks? I mean, that to me is one of the biggest, like, I don't, I don't really worry about robot takeovers, but I do worry very, very much about the people building the robots, deploying the robots and their incentives in a world where, yes, we know we live in this capitalist world where we are now the product and data and advertising, and you have entire industries that are built around manipulating people's behavior, whether it's like the lighting and the colors in the casino to the shopping mall, to the like button online that you're more likely to click on. And social robots could be that on steroids. Um, and that really concerns me. I do think we're gonna be facing a lot of consumer protection issues once companies start really leaning into that aspect of this technology and once it gets more widespread. So I am concerned about that. I do think that, again, this is not a problem with the robots themselves so much as a problem with the, the society that we are you know, putting them into. And there's a lot that we can do in terms of thinking about regulation or caring about privacy and protecting consumers that we can do politically to prepare for that. And that, that lets us lean into some of the positives if we can develop robust systems around it. Uh, and I know that's difficult, but that is the conversation we should be having. I love it. And it very much parallels the conversation we're having, the conversations we're having around emotion AI as well, right? There's a lot of potential for good, but a lot of potential for abuse as well. And we have to, A, we as thought leaders have to advocate for the right way to do this, but also partner with, you know, thoughtful regulation or advocate for thoughtful regulation to do this right. So and I've always admired how you do that. And you also talk about it in your book too. So I, yeah, I think that it's, it's amazing to see a leader in the space who cares enough because the, there's not truly a, a huge incentive to, to care about these issues, but there are people like you who do care and, and, um, you know, it's, it, that, I, that, that's game changing. So Richard is asking, and uh, we're going to wrap up. Um, I want to teach a course um, about robot ethics. Can I contact either of you for an interview or conversation? What's the best way to get hold of you, Kate? Uh, the best way, well, right now I'm on maternity leave, obviously, but um, probably via Twitter is the best way to get in touch with me. Same for me as well, um, Richard, and look forward to the conversation. Okay, so final question, Kate. If you could wave a magic wand, what social, what robot, I won't say social, what robot would you like to have? Wally. Wally. <laughs> yeah, Wally's awesome. What about you? I would like to have a robot that can uh, make us dinner. And I, and I think, you know, the robot needs to come up with the recipe, healthy food, talk to Alexa to make sure that the food actually makes it to our house and then just cooks it all up and we show up for dinner. That's my, can you build that? Can you? <laughs> I, I, I actually think we're a long ways from that, sadly. <laughs> okay. Yes. Love but, <laughs> but, maybe, but I do think it's, it is, yes. Please, Uber, someone, Uber. someone build this robot, please. Yeah, exactly. If you're, if you're a roboticist uh, listening in, please, please build us a robot that can make dinner. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was wonderful. Thank you so much, Rana. Thank you so much for doing this. This is so great.
Well, thank you everybody for joining in and all the thoughtful questions. Um, and don't forget to order Kate's book. It's a great read. Please, I couldn't have said it better myself. Don't forget to check out the new breed on harvard.com and Girl Decoded. Oh, Lauren, oh. We lost Lauren. Maybe she'll come back. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, again, thank you everybody for joining. Thank you, Kate, for joining while you're on maternity, maternity leave. Uh, this was great and hope to see you soon. Hopefully on campus in September. Yes, yes. let's hang out on campus. All right, everyone, great. everyone come to campus. All right. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Everybody. Bye.